In a future of tourism guest blog in March, my friend and peer Frank Kuipers from Belgium had this to say, and I quote, too many destination marketers seem to freeze in fear and wait until all their stakeholders, politicians, or colleagues in the industry are on board. This is a perfect example of circular reasoning, refusing to do something new until everyone agrees that it works, even though no one can know that the new thing will work until they try it. How many times have we heard this should be the new direction, but our people are not there yet. Some people are afraid of transforming tourism because it means losing the perceived stability of business as usual. COVID-19 has made one thing clear. It's no use going back to business as usual. In many places, the old ways of business have already been lost. After this crisis resolves, the old usual won't exist either. And that's okay, says Frank Kuipers. My guest today is not afraid to act, to change, to adapt, and to improve. Officially, Michael Nagy is the Director of Marketing Sales for the magnificent Fairmont Copacabana in Rio de Janeiro. Unofficially, if you ask me, I think his title should be Rio's Ambassador Emeritus Extraordinaire, a bon vivant who embodies the excitement, the majesty, and the authenticity that Rio has to offer. In a market that annually sees 70% of its arrivals as international, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact and the aftershocks will be felt for years to come. But Michael Nagy isn't waiting for a return to normal or a return to business as usual. He's committed to reinventing Rio's tourism industry to be more resilient, more inclusive, and more successful. When I talk to Michael Nagy, I'm, I'm inspired. His head-on approach to accepting the inevitability of change and his focus on getting to work right now on building a better future for Rio is something we can all learn from. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm, I'm about to call my mother and find out why that wasn't all that wasn't written on my birth certificate. <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> How are you? Excuse me, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed here now. You've, you've, you've set the bar. You've made it too, too, too official here. Well, mm. like Michael, when I meet people who know you, they all say the same thing. You're your irrefutable energy to, to move this industry forward is always there. I've watched you in other interviews. I've seen you in podcasts, listened to you. Um, your energy for all things Rio and all things tourism is remarkable. So, you know, take the compliment. <laughs> uh, it's taken. I'm, I've, I'm actually, pr I've written it all down and I'm keeping it in my pocket. When they say, have your ID, please, I'm going to say David Peacock said. So, Very yeah, good. Keeping, David, you good? So you're, where are you right now? Right this second, I'm sitting inside the Fairmont Rio de Janeiro in my office, uh, having this wonderful conversation with yourself, trying to find out what we're doing tomorrow. So it's going to be fun. So, so in terms of what we're doing tomorrow, let's start with the last year. We all around the world work in various destinations and industries that have been hugely impacted. And I think it's really valuable when we share what that's been like. There's a lot of commonalities and a lot of differences. Tell me, you know, in an overview sort of way, what's it been like since last March in, in Rio at the Fairmont in, and in the, in the city of Rio? Well, geez, how do you explain the apocalypse? Uh, basically, it was uh, this property, uh, the first Fairmont in South America, Quad Hotels, a big investment. We put it together in five months. We became the reference hotel in the city. We had an amazing carnival. Um, we were actually very lucky, uh, and I think this baby, what I'm about to say, was is probably the the, the 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 foundations of how we got through this. We work for a company called Accord, Accord Hotels, Bazin, our president, and uh, while this in November of 2019, we were already getting information because we have hotels in China, in Asia, and everywhere else. We weren't really adhering it to it. Um, and Carnival coming up in February. And actually, on the 5th of January, I walked into the office and I called in my GM, who's one of the most amazing guys you can meet now to. I said, listen, we're about to receive a lot of Chinese clients over, um, and Asian clients, uh, but especially from China, um, in uh, Carnival. Don't you think we should like just prepare our team? Because we don't want them to mistreat the clients. So actually, on the 5th of January, we actually brought in a, a medical crew to teach every single one of our staff what was COVID. Now, what we had given to us back in January 2020 is nothing that we know today. But again, 
we started implementing um, alcohol dispensers through the hotel and we shouldn't be scared of the guy wearing the mask and everything. And our team took it easy. It worked like hell. Um, it worked very well. So we go through carnival, what a celebration, which, you know, being very privileged to be in Rio. And who hasn't been to Rio carnival? Get ready for next year, because if there's one carnival, we are really going to make a fun with it's next year. Um, so we do carnival and then the lockdown came. Um, caught us all by surprise. If we look back a card and as a company, they took the best decision. We returned every penny to every client who wanted their money back. Um, and we started the process. So the first thing was getting everybody home, closing the hotel and how to start working. And locking somebody like me up at home wasn't the best of them, best option. But anyway, so we started. Now, as we start this process, the first thing we did, and I think, again, I, I'm going to say this a few times, and there's a reason, because I do believe that you actually learn from others. So our president, Bazan, does a podcast, and he says, guys, take care of each other. So what me and my team did, we spent the next three months, and I'm saying three months, 4,263 people is who we spoke to. We were on calls every single day and calling people just, how are you? How are you doing? Do you need anything? And we literally did that for three months. And I was getting on calls at eight in the morning and finishing at eight at night, other than the business calls and the budget calls and what have you. Um, and I think getting in touch with people and at the beginning, it was, oh, this is going to end, this is going to end. And as it prolonged, it's not going to end, it's not going to end. And it made you human. It made you actually look at the human being and see how, how, how important it is connected. And what most surprised me, David, was that we would call somebody from an agency. And we'd convince them to put everybody of the agency online. And they hadn't actually spoke to each other for three months. So we were proud to actually be putting, putting people together to talk about things, which I think is what we do as a company. A remarkable response, and, and it speaks to the kind of um, caring and quality that you've always delivered, not just as Michael Nagy, but as Fairmont as well. I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that level of attention. I'm encouraged to see that you reached outside your own ranks and shared with the people who will make up your suppliers and your and your you know the people who work with you. And I know that I know that you were reaching out constantly to your guests as well to reassure them that. Um, as we reemerge, this will be better. Um, but as you say, back in February, March, April, we didn't know what that looked like. We know today in some sense what that looked like. You talked to me the other day, really about a 70% drop in business over the, over the same period last year with inbound flights essentially canceled. 70% of your, it's not quite 70% of your inbound is international completely. So what does that look like when you hit June, July, August? Well, it's part of this process we were talking about. Um, we were doing, when we closed, 78% of our effective occupancy was foreign business travel and events. We didn't talk to the national market. It was when what we had was corporate. We didn't look at leisure. We became an, a very effective, very powerful corporate luxury hotel for the high-end user. And the TMCs were buying us, GDS, we would plug and play. As I said, we knew what we did. We didn't actually have to look for clients. And I think at this time, back in March, February, March, worldwide, a lot of our industry were very comfortable with what they had. We all knew what we were doing. We knew when the trade fairs were going to be. We knew the tendencies. I mean, you were more worried about, is there an outbreak of uh, SARS in Asia than anything else? Or is the dollar going up or down? And that was how you did your business. In this process of talking to people and talking to our team, we started finding out that all of a sudden, maybe in maybe in May, June, we started seeing some people say, "Well, look, I've got to get back on the on the on on the horse because well, I don't know when things are going to happen." So our team uh, came up with something which I think, if anything, and my suggestion to everybody is do it: stop owning your own content. Stop making it difficult for people to get access to your information. So what we did was we took every single piece of writing, picture, video, photo, logo, story, 
anything I had in marketing, we put together the Fairmont Tools uh, sales kit, and I'll send you a copy afterwards. Basically, I gave full access to every single travel agent, incentive house, TMC operator, that he could take my, my, my logo, my photos, put his logo on, and do whatever he wanted with it. Michael, Your that's... Okay, that's a, I'm going exactly the same place as you. Why? Because to me, that's the future of tourism, a distributed network of information that's validated in other places. But please, tell me the why. The why is simple. At that time, everybody was looking for one client. I have a joke at the time, and it's actually pertinent to today, that we were basically at the, at the moment where I am today, which Monday to Thursday, a pregnant woman is a group. If she brings her husband, it's a convention. And if the, if the mother-in-law comes... I'm repeating the bloody uh, uh, Olympics. From Thursday to Sunday, I'm okay. So, you know, but why? The, the big why was they, they were fighting to find clients. I had no clients. Now, if I give him the power and I divide the action with him, that the moment he has a client, he can take my picture, put his logo on it. He can do whatever he wants and he's not brand controlled. I'm giving him the power to sell anything. And what happened? That's what they did. So from May, June onwards, I was having a whole lot of new clients. So in, these, in the, are domestic, these are domestic clients for anybody a change. Anybody in the world. Anybody in the world. But there's a difference. Right. Right. The reaction globally was far more conservative in terms of it's not going to get better. Um, everybody was hearing that... Uh, the conventions were being cancelled, be it IMAX, ITBs, WTEMs, whatever. It was a retraction totally. There was the confusion with the onlines. Did they pay? Did they pay? The restrictions on the consortiums were very strong. And there was a total sort of retraction. Let's wait and see. Whereas here, people were going, I want to get out. Uh, so we were giving it out. And anybody that gave us the indication that they were actually going to go and do some online marketing with this, that's what we wanted to do. So the more people that had access to my information, better it worked. And it did work. I was getting agents who had never bought a single room night with the Fairmont in Brazil, all of a sudden putting a picture of my swimming pool and saying, when we can travel, this is the dream. And other that's things. Excellent. putting, And now... But, but this is the intelligence that the team had. And I always use this phrase, there is no I in teamwork. It's if you give people the thing and the, listen, I don't know what every agent wants to sell or who he sells to or how he sells to. Now, the fact I give him my content and he can actually design it that to the client that he knows, that's marketing intelligence. Because so I, build, building a network like that. In a, in a nutshell, you're saying all I had to do was to give up a little bit of control over my media and I built a network of people who want to share for me. You use that same thinking in Rio. And, and I know I know some of the work you've done, which is, you know, you talk about being the Fairmont, but you work very well with the people in Rio, with the people of Rio. And I look at some of the out there kind of stuff you've done, like in the middle of a pandemic, it became a priority to develop um, – a homegrown art scene and you, you contributed to a program um, about about art in the streets. Tell me about some of the partnerships in Rio that have emerged as a part of this crisis because it, it's, it's, in, it's in everything you do. I can see that. Well, it's basically the concept comes out of the following. As marketing in any country, in any as sales or marketing in any company, they have the worst budgets and they're always the first budgets cut. So as I knew that was coming, I could see I've been around for a while. So I knew that was going. What we basically did was I started calling every CEO, every marketing director I know of any company and asking what they were doing. I heard the following phrase. We've got no money. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to activate. So for instance, I'll give you a story. Uh, you're talking about art at Fairmont. So basically, we got artists who we know. And we've created that every three months, each season, we invite a famous Brazilian artist to put his pieces in our hotel and we will do vernissage and everything. We had that all set up. We couldn't do it. So what we've done is we've brought in selected artists for this. And we've made it available that where you walk through this hotel, you actually have access to art. So every art piece has a QR code on it. You can tell the story. You can read the story. So if it's a rainy day and you need to walk through the hotel, you can actually go through 
You can be at an art uh, museum if you like. And it's all Brazilian stuff. So it's actually giving them education, culture. And who knows, they actually buy a piece. And then whatever's left over, we donate to charity. Um, and But what we did was, I'll give an example. Uh, and this is probably the, the mainstay to everything we did. In April, I called a guy called Mazala, who is the guy who has the rights to the Montreux Jazz Festival in Brazil. And this is April, at the height of the thing. I said, are you going to do the Jazz Festival? He goes, we can't do the Jazz Festival. I said, well, look, it was the time everybody was doing lives. So I said, look, I've got the hotel closed. Why don't we put you at the swimming pool, get somebody to play. We do a mantra jazz live. A oh, great idea. Let's think about we'll call you back in a couple of weeks. And I'm a pretty insistent person. So I called him back the next day. He said, I had a better idea. Why don't we take out, because our hotel is privileged, it has uh, 96 rooms like facing the pool. Let's put people in the rooms, call it social distancing, and put the show at the pool. And nice. televise it to the thing. He goes, give me two weeks, I'll call you back. Two months later, he called me, it's set up, we've done it. We're going to do it in September. I didn't even have a date when I was going to open the hotel. Um, and what happened was, in September, we did the only Montreux Jazz Festival live from Rio. Macy Gray played in a studio in, uh, in New York and was televised here locally. We was televised on YouTube. We have to Tokinu. Uh, Milton Dorland, a whole lot of guys here. We had studios set up. And we actually managed to put everybody in the rooms watching the festival and have a televised real time. Fantastic. So one of the one of the discussions I've been really intrigued with the last couple months is this idea of the virtual destination. And in the world today, we know now we reached a point a long time ago when more people will experience your destination virtually than will ever actually visit it. And it was, it was Andreas Wiesenborn from destinations international and Ed Tomasi from esports who said, and it's time that destination organizations recognize that they're competing with concerts and esports and sporting events. And that when we look at their content, it's going to grow and get better. So I'm, I'm totally into the idea of a virtual but mantra. I agree, but I agree and disagree with that comment. Go on. I actually think they're there without wanting to be, how can I say this? Um, it's very easy to make that comedy at the moment, but I'll give you some feedback. I've had clients come to the hotel, Americans, Europeans, and Brazilians, who saw the show of Montreux, and that made them want to come to Rio. 100%. But, and that's the kind of content that it took to cut through the clutter, though. So, so in reality, what's happened is the live shows have become boring now. None of us, we, none of us want to actually watch a live show anymore on TV. I mean, nobody wants to do that. So, so are you saying, Michael Nagy, you're saying augmented reality might be better than reality? <laughs> it's starting it's, to look that way. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you some more insights on this. So what we then did was, oh, hang on, this entertainment thing works. So we called in a partner. And this guy and I were having a coffee one day. And he said, how do you do this? And I said, we did it like this. And he goes, listen, I want to put a show here. I said, look, I've got no money to pay for your artist. I'll give you the space and we can do it like this. Revenue share, revenue share. We recreated something called Infinity Summer. We did the month of November, December, every Thursday, a live show and filled the rooms so people could watch shows. We had the Gypsy King, Shiku, played here in November. Fabulous. I mean, and, and it is about, and this is what I think this is comes out to the key what people have to think about for the next, I would say, 18 to 24 months. We each have to look at our organizations, understand what we have as value, and find partners that have the added value. Hospitality industry for me today, I've gone back to the 1980s, 1990, where I actually have to pick up a phone and call a guy and do a cold call because he won't receive me. And I have to tell, ask him what his business is, what his profile is, and find out how, what I can get him to buy with me. Now, the wow. calculation is very simple. If you take, I'll give an example. I was talking to one of my team the other day, and I said, what is your function? He goes, I'm an account executive. I said, okay, well, how many accounts are you executing? Because it doesn't sound like you're doing much. So I took his, his, his accounts. I took out everybody that produces and gave him everything that's zeroed. I said, come and see me in three weeks. 1.8 million of sales. Wow. wow. He has to call okay. people he doesn't call before. Right. This is right. the outset of it. 
I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally warmed by the idea of the telephone because I'm a big believer. I, I love the digital interactions we can have. I think it's changed the way we look at the world. I think we've got much better at it over the last year out of necessity, but I still have a cat cardinal rule with my people as well, which is if it's really important, pick up the phone. Uh, David, you know, that's amazing because I remember before COVID, you would get an email and you would turn to your team, did you reply? Yeah, I sent them an email. Today, any email they arrives, they pick up the phone. Yeah, we got your email. Just to double check, you've created a relationship. That's how, what people want. That's what we need today. We've gone back to old school. COVID, I... COVID has helped the business sales world. And if we really stop and think, we've all had to rethink everything we do. So we should actually give a clap hands that the fact COVID exists, not that it's a good thing because we have to take care of everything. Um, and it's about taking care and no company better than ourselves, a card with all safe. I mean, we have 150 protocols in place here. I mean, well, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Well, and a, a core situation and Rio situation is echoed around the world, which is it also reminds us just how important our destination is to us and how we sometimes when the sun's shining, we're making hay and we're forgetting the necessity to align and work with and engage and improve. So I challenge you. I have to challenge you. Go on. Explain the Rio image that you just made reference to. Because what you guys are getting abroad is not the reality what is happening here. Today, 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 Rio de Janeiro has only 57% of its hospital beds full. Brazil has, you've got to remember something. If you take the US, you take Brazil. When we talk about percentages, we're always going to be bigger than everybody else because we have 210 million people. You have 300 and something million people. So it's, it's sure, it's sure. Um, what, what concerns me is, and I think we should all be concerned, is my, my question to any public servant today is how many beds are you opening to take care of people? COVID only showed the world, all of us, that the, our govern, governments around the world are not ready to take care of health. So it's health and education has to be done. And um, because it's it's about saving lives. One, it's, it's that famous phrase that one life lost is one less uh, um, soul in the world. And one life changed is maybe a whole population new. So I think it's about taking care of people. And I think that's something else we're doing. I mean, we used to criticize anybody we saw with a mask on 10, 15 years ago. Oh, I don't want to sit next to that guy. He was actually taking care of himself because we were the ones transmitting the wrong thing. So... Uh, but Brazil, unfortunately, we get an image across the world, which is not, it's not actually factual. It needs to be better approved. Sorry, wait, wait, what image, Michael? And so I'm outside looking in, and I've, I've worked in Brazil a number of times. I, I worked in uh, Sao Paulo uh, with, with um, uh, Bondarada's TV. What, what do you mean when you say looking in? Because we see, uh, you know, progressive culture that is, you know, sometimes at the vicissitudes of, of world economics more than some places, but I've, I've found a warm and embracing culture of people who were kind and sharing. That's my view of, of, of a Rio or a Sao Paulo. But at, the, at this time, you, as you know, you come to this country, we, we don't ask where you're from. It's who are you and how, how much, what can we do together? Uh, Brazilians want to embrace. We're, we're suffering a lot because we are hug. We, we like to hug. We like to kiss. It's sure. difficult, you know, with all this, uh, this stuff. But it's All the right. image people have of Brazil as an economy and, and as if things here aren't going right. It's amazing. Economically, this country's on the upswing. Yeah. And it's yeah. going to make a big difference. Well, I, I, I will tell you, you know, my, my indoctrination to Brazil was to go to what I think is if still technically the second largest city in the world, correct, uh, in Sao Paulo, oh, yeah. and, and stand at the middle of that hill where the television tower is and look in every direction and say, I have never seen anything like this in my life in person. So you worked for Bandeirantes. I didn't know that. I, no, I worked for City TV in Toronto who worked with Bandeirantes. Well, as we're talking about innovation, let me tell you a story. So we're going through this pandemic and uh, Bandeirantes came to talk to me because they wanted to launch a new TV program. So I convinced them to film the whole thing in our hotel. We've just done an afternoon news, let's say, like a, 
uh, how can you say, uh, so, uh, lifestyle magazine. 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 Yep. Done. It's called a Vanquish Inch. Come with us. Um, and they've revamped it. The whole program was filmed in this hotel. So wow. when, they were, when she was doing an interview with somebody at our breakfast, she'd say, look where I'm sitting at the Fairmont. And she would point out a QR code, click here and buy, the, my, buy my package at the hotel. 250000 in sales. Fantastic. Okay, so that, that leads me into my next question, which, I, I, Michael, I could talk to you all day. I don't want to take your, all your time. And I, I, I'm not I, going I'm, anyway, David. I'm, right. I'm we're we're, we're going to come back and have another interview on this. But, but in closing this one, keeping it into the half-hour bracket that it fits, um, I want to ask you about luxury because I know it's something you have worked so hard on. Um, not just doing, but understanding and and helping to shape it. So what is luxury? And I, I, I asked that question in the context of one of the things we haven't talked a lot about in this industry is how does luxury recover? And I think of cruise lines and top end experiences, but I know you have a personal philosophy on luxury. So if you could, in, in closing, share us your philosophy of luxury. Experience. You have to create the experiences. People uh, in this moment we've lived in, more than ever, people want to have something. They want to feel important. They want to feel different. They want to feel that they, they're actually alive. And if you take it to the simple fact, as we are talking earlier, um, we have a package where we called it the dream stay. And we gave people a stay in, a, in the spa and dinner. The thing they most love doing is getting the experience of learning how to make a cocktail. And you give two people, four people, a chance to sit with a barman for 45 minutes and he'll teach you the essence of the drink, where it comes from. You should be a fly on the wall to watch. They don't leave. They want to, they just, I mean, we put beach tennis as an option. We've got a lot going on here. The art is an option. Um, but it, when it comes down to you putting somebody in front of a staff member and allowing that person, we're not, we're putting in front of a barman to teach you how to make either a non-alcoholic or alcoholic drink, it's, it actually comes down to probably the essence of what Fairmont stands for, which is we have a saying, well, our, our phrase is that a moment becomes a memory. That's experience. It's making that one, it's, it's become to the point, we, we started something where every, every like person who came, we would put balloons in the rooms and they started posting it. Now, if I don't put a balloon in the room, I'll get complaints. She's not complaining how much it costs the room. It's that there's no balloon in the room because her friend had a balloon. So it's what's actually teaching us is that luxury is experiences. And people immediately like to see that other people had an experience and want to have the same. But what's better than all of this? We all make it our own at the end of the day because we're all different. And that's what's fun. So if I had to say to anybody... Uh, in the world is luxury is the future. I think we come to a point where we know what we want. COVID's given us enough time to figure out. We, if you haven't had a psychiatrist before, you've probably done a lot of your own psychoanalysis over COVID. I mean, look at your beard, David. That's there, there's a point. There must be a story behind that one. And the um, story is you can't get a haircut in, in Canada right now. That's the story, but yes. And, and as you know, our origins is Canadian. Um, so, and today we, we belong to our card and, and I also would like to, I have to say this, if it wasn't our president doing these podcasts and the best thing I'd like to use this phrase to everybody that Bazan gave, he said, look, don't be scared of making decisions. Eight out of 10, you're going to be right. Stop. You don't need to get approval to do something today. It's make the difference. And I think that's, uh, that's part of luxury as well. Our team is trained to make sure the client is treated like a star. And we have this document internally that we show to all our staff every day as the clients are arriving. And we have called, we have the superstars, the rock stars. And that is every, every single client who walks in this hotel for us. He's as big as Mick Jagger, Stevie Wonder. They're all going to be treated that way. It's make, make a difference. Difference. So, Michael, I'm I'm so thankful for having you here today. Um, you know that idea that that Michael Nagy isn't afraid to change, adopt, and improve. I think we we've, we've hit on that in in spades. But I'm really appreciate the idea. Luxury 
doesn't necessarily have six zeros behind it. Luxury is someone spending time with you, helping you make a, a cocktail you've never made before. And I think that's really humanizing thought, as is the idea of picking up the phone. It's, it's great to talk to you. I want to circle back with you as we roll into the summer and, and, and see what it's going. And man, if I could get there for, for the, um, the first carnival in two years, that would be a cool thing too. So well, I, it's, I it's a great I've, pleasure. I've got four Canadians living here because I don't want to be back in the cold. There it These is. Four <laughs> guys have left. They can, they're working. They, they can't get to the office. And they've come and chosen to stay at the Fairmont for three months. I was going to say, so what about you took all the Fairmont Kananaskis Lodge Calgary uh, snowboard instructors and turned them into surf instructors? <laughs> um, <laughs> I can tell you what we've done with the, with the, with the, uh, with the um, fashion industry. We've gone further. Go on. We had a client who came to me. He wanted to do a launch of a product here. So I said, okay, I like the idea but only if we can make money together. Because, well, how are you going to make money with me? I said, every single piece of clothing, I'm going to give you, I'm going to create a code, and you're going to promote it on every single piece of clothing that when people buy it, they get a discount and a special package to stay at the hotel, and you will give them a price. Basically, 78,000 pieces of clothes for the new collection of Colchi, the girl from Rio. On the etiquette, there is a QR code you click on it and you can buy and you get a discount and a special package to stay at the Fairmont. That's luxury, that's experience, and that's unique. To me, that sounds, like, that sounds like living in Wallpaper Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty well, cool. Listen, it's, it's all about the, uh, Roberto Migina, who is the owner and the creator of Rock in Rio. He says a phrase that we don't think outside of the box here in Brazil because we don't actually have a box. <laughs> So my suggestion to everybody, stop using that phrase and don't be scared to make mistakes. Don't be scared. You, because just what it, just by trying, you've made the world a better place. Go for it. It's out there. You can find it. Michael Nagy, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Um, your, your passion and your drive is infectious, and I, I can't say enough thanks for being here. Well, thank you, David. And listen, you guys keep up this good work because we need to be inspired. And I look forward to seeing your other interviews and everything. And I'm ca I'm chasing the beard. It's a challenge, ladies and gentlemen. It's a challenge. You're, you're going to have to get older. No, no, no. This is the difference. Here in Brazil, we like to be two-toned. <laughs> okay. There it is. Thanks, Michael. Good.